Hello, this is Matt Dean with A-Plus College Ready. Today we're going to talk about linear momentum. Linear momentum is the property or tendency of a moving object to continue moving. You can see the equation for momentum here. P stands for momentum. Notice that it has an arrow over the P that indicates that momentum is a vector, so both magnitude and direction matter. Momentum is equal to an object's mass times its velocity. Again, note the arrow over the velocity to indicate that velocity is also a vector. The units for momentum are either a kilogram times a meter over a second or a newton times a second. Remember that mass is usually measured in kilograms and velocity is usually measured in meters per second. So kilogram meters per second. Also note that momentum, the change in momentum of an object can be equal to force times change in time. That quantity is known as impulse and we'll talk more about it on the next slide. So again, linear momentum um, can be thought of as the well, the rate of change of momentum of an object is equal to the net force applied to the object. So we could write that like this. Net force is equal to change in momentum over change in time. This is essentially another way of writing Newton's second law. Because remember that momentum, change in momentum, is equal to m delta v. So if we plug m delta v in for change in momentum, we end up with uh, net force equals m delta v over delta t. Remember that delta v over delta t is acceleration. So we could also rewrite that same law as f net equals ma. So again, net force equals delta p over delta t is another way of writing net force equals ma, Newton's second law. So we mentioned impulse a minute ago. Sometimes we can rewrite the equation for uh, momentum like so. F delta T equals M delta V. The F delta T portion of this equation is known as impulse. Oftentimes you'll see impulse abbreviated with a J. So impulse is the net force applied to an object and the amount of time that it's applied. That's equal to M delta V. This portion is known as the change in momentum and we'll oftentimes see it abbrevi abbreviated as delta P. So impulses cause changes in momentum. Forces applied over time, we could say, cause changes in momentum. A bigger force causes a bigger change in momentum or the same force applied over a longer time can cause a bigger change in momentum. As I said a minute ago, impulse is often symbolized with the letter J. So, a golf ball's momentum is changed dramatically by a large force applied over a short time. So you hit the ball really hard. Another way that you can cause the golf ball's momentum to change even more, though, is to follow through with your swing. By following through, the club is in contact with the ball for longer. So you've got a certain force, but you're going to increase the time, thereby increasing the impulse, and if you increase the impulse, you also increase the change in momentum because the ball is going to leave that club going faster than it otherwise would. Another way to think about impulses is by thinking about airbags. An airbag decreases the amount of force stopping an individual, like during a car accident, by increasing the amount of time. So the momentum of the person has to change by a fixed amount. The speed that that person was going at has to go from whatever speed they're at to zero. But what, um, what the airbag does is it increases this amount of time. Therefore, the force that's stopping the person can be smaller. If this amount of time was really, really small, that would mean that this force would be really, really big and it would cause damage to the person. It's also the reason that when you jump off of something high, when you land, you want to bend your legs. That process of bending your legs increases the stopping time, thereby decreasing the stopping force. And that helps to prevent you from breaking a leg or something like that. So we also want to talk about force versus time graphs. 
force on the y, time on the x-axis. Remember that when we find the area under a curve, essentially what we're doing is we're multiplying y times x. And we just learned a second ago that force times time is equal to impulse. So on a force versus time graph, the area under the curve is equal to the impulse, or J. We might also say that this area is also equal to the change in momentum of the object, because we said a second ago that impulse equals change in momentum, or we could write that as F delta T, impulse, equals M delta V, change in momentum. So momentum is another one of those quantities like energy that is conserved. The total momentum of an isolated or closed system is conserved during collisions and or explosions. Now we want to think of a collision as a very short term um, interaction between objects. Same with an explosion. We might write the law of conservation of momentum like so. Where MA is the mass of the first object. VA is its initial velocity. MB is the mass of the second object. VB is its initial velocity. So we can think of these things being before the collision. On the other side, these are the things after the collision, the quantities after the collision. So same mass of, of the first object, same mass of the second object. VA prime is the velocity after the collision for, for object A. And VB prime is the object after the collision for object B. We also mentioned an isolated system a minute ago, or a closed system. This is the one in which there's no significant forces that are external. We might say there's no external forces. The only forces acting on the objects in the system are internal forces. And because of Newton's third law, the sum of those internal forces is zero. We're going to talk about a couple of types of collisions. Let's start by talking about elastic collisions. During elastic collisions, the objects collide. They usually bounce off of each other. But during these collisions, both the momentum and the total amount of kinetic energy of the system are conserved. So the momentum before the collision is equal to the momentum after the collision. The kinetic energy of the, um, before the collision is equal to the kinetic energy after the collision. Then we'll talk about inelastic collisions. In inelastic collisions, the objects collide, and some of that kinetic energy of the system is, is lost. It's converted to other forms of energy, like thermal energy, heat, or sound. Momentum is still conserved. Momentum is conserved in all short-term collisions, but kinetic energy is not. Most of the problems that we'll deal with are going to be about completely inelastic or, in, or elastic collisions. In completely inelastic collisions... The objects collide and they stick together and they move off as one object. After the collision, or during the collision, some of the kinetic energy is converted to other forms of energy like heat, thermal energy, or sound. Momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not in completely inelastic collisions. Now here we're looking at a, an equation for an elastic collision in one dimension with two unknown quantities. So here's our conservation of momentum equation. A problem that we might see like this would be one where we, where we know the mass of the two objects, we know their initial velocities, but what we don't know is the final velocity for either object. So we could set up an equation like so for the conservation of momentum. We could also set up an equation like so for the conservation of kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy before, one half mv squared, is equal to the kinetic energy after. So now we have two equations, we have two unknowns, so we're going to solve one of those equations for one of the variables. So notice we rearranged the momentum equation, we did a little rearranging of the kinetic energy equation, Simplified that out a bit, and then divided the kinetic energy equation by the momentum equation, and came up with this equation. Now, this is going to be an important equation that you'll see in a lot of the problems that we'll use later. Sometimes we'll see it written like so, 
we might say it see V1 plus V1 prime equals V2 plus V2 prime. So we're saying that um, in, a, in an elastic collision, the initial velocity of object 1 plus the final velo velocity after the collision of object 1 is equal to the initial velocity of object 2 plus the velocity of object 2 after the collision. So this is an equation you want to notate and you want to remember because it's going to be really helpful when we're working uh, elastic collision problems in, in one dimension. So remember that for, collisions can also happen in more than one dimension. So maybe we have a, so a, some, some pool balls like so, and we get sort of a glancing blow, it's not straight on. Maybe one of the balls goes like this, and one of the balls maybe goes like this. Either way, momentum is still conserved. We're going to have to use some vectors to solve out what's the velocity of this ball after the collision. What's the velocity of this ball after the collision? And we'll see some example problems for collisions in more than one dimension in our Momentum Practice Problems screencast. We also want to mention the center of mass. The center of mass is the point in a system of objects or particles that moves in the same path that a single particle would move if subjected to the same net force. So think of like a basketball. So if you shoot a basketball the right way, it spins. So it's spinning. But if we find the center of that mass of the basketball, it would move through its projectile trajectory exactly the same way that just a single point would. To find the center of mass of the object, you can use these two equations. So to find the x-coordinate of the center of mass, you take mass 1 plus position, uh, the center of mass of that, that object, plus 2, you divide by the total mass. And notice this has these ellipses. That means if you have more than two masses, you just keep following the same pattern. You're going to find the y-coordinate the same way. The reason we're bringing up center of mass when we're in a momentum unit is that the, the linear momentum of an extended object, so this could be something long and spread out, or a system of objects, like in a closed system, is equal to the product of the total mass of the extended object and the velocity of the center of mass of that object. Because momentum in a closed system is conserved during collisions and explosions, the velocity of the center of mass of the system doesn't change after the collision or the explosion. The velocity of the center of mass is constant. And on pretty much every AP Physics 1 exam over the last couple of years, there's been a problem where you had to know that the velocity of the center of mass of a, of a closed system or of an extended object doesn't change after the collision. It remains the same as it was before the collision. Momentum is conserved. That's it. Hope that helped.